Here I am on Svalbard. It's an archipelago, 800 miles from the North Pole. There are polar bears and glaciers, and also the most amazing genetic library I've ever seen. Hey guys, Trace here for DNews. Thanks for tuning in. If you've never heard of Svalbard before, it's this place right here. Way up on top of the planet, far away from civilization, but Svalbard might be one of the most important places in the world. It's really cool, and we get to go inside. You know, this is quite simply a, a hole in the mountain. <laughs> in there, you have actually 13,000 years history of agriculture. It's quite amazing. That's Marie Haga. She is the executive director of the Crop Trust, the group that oversees the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. Inside that vault are boxes, and inside those boxes? Seeds, quite simply seeds. So normally somewhere between 300 and 500 seeds in these aluminum foil envelopes. And that's all there is, nothing else. What is unique in Svalbard is that we collect seeds from absolutely all over the world, or countries or institutions choose um, to use this as a backup facility. The main reason it's so far north is because Svalbard is cold. It's got a permafrost, meaning the ground never really thaws even in the summer. Most seeds um, can be stored long term at minus 18 degrees, or they can keep for a long time at, uh, at a temperature that isn't that uh, cold either. Um, but that's sort of the perfect temperature. By digging a 130 meter tunnel deep into the mountain, the vault is underneath that permafrost, meaning they only had to cool it the remaining 12 Celsius. At that temperature, the 860,000 varieties currently in the vault can be held for decades. Some wheat varieties could last a thousand years. But aside from serving as a backup for the global food machine, the seed vault also represents something else, a genetic library of evolutionary successes. Wheat originates in well, certainly the Middle East. Now we grow wheat absolutely all over the world. The thing is that it has taken many thousand years for these plants to move around the globe. The challenge these days is really that the climate changes so fast, so the plants are not able to adopt. And that is really the fundamental challenge for agriculture these days. And we need to help these plants to adopt faster. And that is why we need to introduce, for example, genes from a wild relative that can make sure that wheat can grow in funny climates with, for example, less water, or that it's able to fight a new disease that stems from climate change. So scientists are traveling the world to gather more seeds and bring those into the vault too, because farmers don't want to grow all these crops in their fields because they need to make dollars, and they and agribusinesses will grow for yield. But when we choose yield over diversity, we lose genetic variety. We in the U.S. only have about 10% of the variety of fruits and vegetables that we had 100 years ago. So if a disease strikes, say, bananas, like is happening now, they could go extinct. They all have the same immune system, and there's nothing we can do. There aren't any other varieties to experiment with, which is why we're cataloging and saving seeds in this vault. There are 3,000 varieties of coconuts, 4,500 varieties of potatoes, 35,000 varieties of corn, 125,000 varieties of wheat, or 200,000 varieties of rice. One of those might have the trait that we need in the future to adopt the rice to whatever it is, higher temperature, higher salinity in the soil, more unpredictable weather, a variety that can fight a new pest or a new disease. And for each one we lose, we lose options to develop plants with traits in the future. In the end, the seed vault isn't just a place where seeds wait to be genetically sequenced and grown again to secure our food supply for the next 9 or 15 billion people who live on the earth in the future. It's also a library of nature's trial and error from the past for dealing with the shifting planet that we live on. And it's one of humanity's greatest science projects. It's ongoing, it's complicated, and it's just plain awe-inspiring. Okay, so now you know why we need the seed vault. But what about for foods that don't have seeds? How did they get that way? Are they some kind of weird Frankenstein hybrid? Not always. It happens naturally from time to time. Check out this video and find out how we got seedless foods.
In botany, breeding seedless fruit is called parthenocarpy. Parthenocarpic fruit can often naturally occur due to mutations or problems with sperm and egg fertilization or through specific hybrid breeding, mixing plants with more or fewer chromosomes to get a sterile offspring. Guys, let us know down in the comments if there are any other big science projects around the world that you think we should visit. And please subscribe so you get more D-News.